Module 7, Neural Dietary Sensors. In this module, we'll explore the biology behind eating behavior. While you've learned about some of the aspects of this biology in earlier classes, we'll use this system as an example of how genes are discovered and how that discovery fuels our understanding of physiology. We'll focus on some of the experimental techniques used to identify the genes in this system. In the most basic terms, obesity results from an imbalance between energy intake and energy expenditure. While low physical activity is a significant factor in obesity, body weight is driven in large part by food intake. In trying to solve the puzzle of obesity, we need to ask some key questions. Why do we overeat? Is eating completely volitional? And what regulates eating behavior? Prior to the discovery of the complex and redundant signaling systems that we now know regulate feeding, it was hypothesized that there are factors that signal the avail availability of stored energy to the body, for example, how much triglyceride you have stored in adipose. These factors were hypothesized to stimulate feeding when stores are low and inhibit feeding when stores are high. As shown on the left, when the brain senses low energy availability, due to an imbalance between energy expenditure and intake, for example, Signals are sent that promote eating behavior by stimulating systems related to liking, wanting, and emotion, thus ensuring the organism will eat sufficient quantities in restrictive environments requiring a high physical activity level. In a perfect system, when intrinsic energy levels in the body are restored, the systems that stimulate eating would then be repressed. Modern environments include high food availability, abundant food cues, and high food palatability, all enhancing areas of the brain in which feeding and reward is, ex is exacerbated. In addition, the built environment, sedentary lifestyle, and low procurement costs are associated with decreased physical activity and in turn increased stored energy. In this model, obesity may develop in prone individuals through amplification of reward pleasure systems associated with eating, combined with resistance to satiety signaling systems. The key is to identify the genes and molecules driving this behavior. Long before any actual neurons or signaling molecules had been identified, Early studies in the 1940s had identified very grossly that the hypothalamus seemed to be an important place um, in regulating some base behaviors like feeding and drinking. And in the 1960s, experiments using lesioning or electrical stimulation of the brain um, identified more accurately specific parts of the hypothalamus related to feeding and drinking. Later studies suggested that the midbrain and areas proximal to the hypothalamus may play a role in mitigating or regulating the activity of the hypothalamus. Um, in this cartoon of the brain, you can see a, an enhanced blow up of the area containing the hypothalamus. And you can see that relative to the size of the brain as a whole, the hypothalamus is a very, very small part of the brain. Yet many, many base functions, including feeding and drinking, are regulated by the hypothalamus. The dual center theory of body weight regulation stated that there were areas of the brain responsible for stimulating and inhibiting eating behavior. Early experiments showed that animals with lesions in the lateral hypothalamus exhibit an eating disorder known as aphasia or absence of eating. Animals with lesions in the ventromedial hypothalamus showed hyperphagia or uncontrolled eating. In this model, the lateral hypothalamus stimulates feeding and the ventromedial hypothalamus suppresses feeding. In the 1960s, the set point theory was proposed and it's still being debated today. The set point theory says that body weight is regulated by some factor that serves as a signal to the brain of stored energy available to the body. As levels of this factor went up and down, signals would be secreted that would regulate metabolic rate and eating behavior accordingly. Despite the fact that it seems that gaining weight is so much easier to do than losing weight, in fact, the body weight is very stable over time. The amount of stored fat at any given time is a reflection of the balance between energy intake and energy expenditure. 
manipulations of energy balance, for example, due to caloric restriction or overeating, elicit physiological responses designed to restore body fat to previous levels. Several studies have provided evidence that supports the set point theory. For example, weight stabilized subjects over or underfed until their body weight was 10% above or below their stable weight showed significant changes in resting metabolic rate. And this was reported in the, a lot of these studies were done in the 1990s. Similarly, lean males who gained an average of 19 kilograms after six months of overfeeding spontaneously returned to their previous weight within two and a half years after resuming their normal eating patterns. So these are just two examples of many studies that have been done where people have been uh, either overfed or underfed and forced to gain or lose weight and then spontaneously allowed to eat in a way that would uh, that seemed appropriate. And these spontaneous eating behaviors are very, very consistent with something like the set point theory that says your body wants to be at a certain weight and your, whether you gain or lose or deviate from that weight, which is not necessarily the weight you want to be at, um, biologic factors will come into play that return you to what the body sees as its ideal weight. In fact, body weight is so stable that it's estimated that a typical 70 kilogram man, about 150 pounds, will gain approximately 10 kilograms, about 20 pounds of body fat over the course of his adult life. This weight gain is comparable to a caloric overconsumption equal to about one carrot stick per day. Now this is a, a statement that's been proposed and it was in the 1990s, it was very inflammatory. Um, and since then people have said that this is probably a very simplistic kind of statement. But it still is a great example of the fact that over the course of your life, weight gain may, may occur and that cumulative effect of that weight gain may be very, very small on a, on a daily basis. This figure shows a general overview of the hypotheses about how body size was regulated, body weight was regulated, um, from based on work from the 1940s forward and prior to the discovery of leptin. And in this system, of course, we, we knew that the hypo hypothalamus was the key regulator of feeding and drinking behavior. And the, the adipocyte is a logical place to hypothesize where signals from stored energy would come from since stored triglycerides are the largest component of stored energy. So in this model, the signal protein would arise from the, the adipocyte. It would be received by a receptor that's expressed in the brain. And based on whether stores were high or low, the brain would then send out signals that would influence feeding behavior and energy expenditure and thus energy balance would be maintained. And whether or not you are a proponent or uh, a, an opponent of the set point theory, this model would explain why body weight remains stable over time. This was all theoretical until some really key studies using some critical animal models were conducted. Two of the most important animal models of obesity occurred spontaneously in the Jackson labs. Um, the first was the obese mouse. So the mutation was named obese because the mice were observed to be growing rapidly as early as 21 days of age, deviating significantly from their wild type counterparts, as you can see on the left. And then by 10 months of age, as you can see on the right, morbidly grossly obese. Then later, about 15 years later, in the 1960s, another spontaneous mutation occurred in which the animals were also grossly obese. The background of these animals is, the C, is called C57 Black 6, so they have the same genetic background and they have the same phenotype as well. The phenotype included gross obesity, hyperphagia or overeating, decreased metabolic rate, hypothyroidism, decreased linear growth, infertility in the females, decreased immune function, and the reason why they knew they were two distinct genes is because when they crossed the heterozygotes of each of those um, 
those mutations, they never produced any mutant offspring. And as you know from your knowledge of Punnett squares and genetic breeding, that if that mutation is recessive, which they knew it was, crossing two alleles of the same gene would eventually produce an obese animal. Because they never did, they knew they were two separate genes. Because the phenotype was so similar, they hypothesized early on that those genes may be in the same pathway. But it wasn't until some really important metabolic experiments were conducted that it was clear what was happening in these two animals. So Doug Coleman and colleagues in, in the early 1970s conducted a series of experiments in which they used parabiosis to examine the effect of the two animal models. So Doug Coleman was, was studying the diabetes gene and he was wondering if that animal was actually lacking some kind of protein that a normal animal would have. So in panel A there, what he did was he surgically connected and it's, a, it's an interesting experiment in which they're just uh, opening up the, the skin and connecting the body cavities, not the inside, but just the external muscular layer of the body cavities, um, which is sufficient for any kind of circulating factors to move back and forth between the two animals. So his original hypothesis was that DB lacked some really important protein. And then if you connected to the DB animals to a normal animal, that protein would flow into the DB animals and um, they would be restored to normal weight. What happened was that nothing happened to the DB animals, but the lean wild type animal actually stopped eating, lowered its blood insulin, lowered blood glucose, and eventually died due to starvation. So strong was some signal coming from the DB that said to the normal mouse, um, stop eating. So then, knowing that DB and OB were two different genes, he connected a DB-DB mouse to an OB-OB mouse. And surprisingly, the results were exactly the same. The OB-OB mouse stopped eating, lowered the food intake, lost weight, and eventually those mice died due to starvation. So he followed up with a third experiment in which he took an OB mouse and connected that OB mouse to the wild type animal. And here, what happened is what he was hoping to happen with the DBs, which was that some naturally present protein would cross over into the defective animal and restore its obesity. And in fact, that's exactly what happened. So when an OB-OB mouse was connected to a wild-type mouse, um, they decreased their food intake, they decreased insulin and glucose, and they normalized body weight, but not to the point of starvation, simply to the point of being restored to the level of the wild type animal. And then the panel D is just showing that they did the same experiment with control wild type animals to show that the surgery itself was not what was causing these effects. So what was concluded was that OB animals were lacking a circulating factor that could be restored by connecting it to a normal mouse, but that DB had a lot of this factor and that when other animals were connected to the DB mouse, this abundance of some factor that had a profound effect on eating behavior and energy balance um, was overwhelming their systems. Thus, the defect in OB is probably in some kind of circulating signaling molecule. And the de defect in DB was hypothesized to be some kind of receptor or fixed molecule that was broken and that the signaling molecule, the ligand for the receptor, was being produced in great abundance because there was being no response um, due to a defective receptor. So armed with this knowledge that the OB mutation was probably in a circulating protein and the DB mutation was probably in a receptor, many groups set out to figure out where the gene was.
And keep in mind that back in the 1990s, we didn't have nearly the tools that we have today. Um, today, we could just sequence the entire genome and look for mutations, but we didn't have that. So uh, the way Friedman and colleagues identified this gene was through some classic linkage mapping, exactly the way people had done in humans. So the OBOB mice, it was clear, you, can, you could see the inheritance patterns, that this was a recessive trait. You can cross OBOB mice to wild type mice, and you know that all of the offspring will be heterozygotes. There's two ways to examine inheritance patterns in animals in a way that you can't do in humans. You can back cross to the OBOB mice, um, and that enriches for the mutation. And in this case, since the OBOB animals are infertile, and basically you back cross, but then you take those over, you take the donor ovaries and transplant them into these recipient females. Or you can do an intercross where you take the offspring, which are both heterozygotes, and cross them with each other. And again, you have an expectation of the numbers of progenies that you might find. So in the case of the bat cross, you're going to see either OBOB animals or heterozygotes. In the case of the intercross, you're going to see um, all three possible genotypes. So using this uh, strategy of linkage mapping, and back then it was called positional cloning, uh, Friedman and his colleagues set out to discover this gene. In an earlier lecture, we talked about how recombination occurs to mix the content of chromosomes as gametes are formed. Um, the probability of recombination, or theta, in the statistical um, modeling of recombination, the probability between two loci is a function of how far apart they are. So for example, two loci on a chromosome that are right next to each other have a lower probability of recombination occurring between them than two loci that are very far apart, simply because there's what much more opportunity for recombination to occur. So this idea of probabilities being related to distance on the chromosome was taken advantage of and used for linkage mapping prior to the ability to directly sequence and determine in bases the distance. Genetic distance is expressed in Morgans after T.H. Morgan, who developed a lot of the statistical basis of uh, recombination probabilities. And a centimorgan refers to about a 1% recombination distance, or about 1,000 kb. If something is, if recombination between a trait, for example, and a place on the genome is occurring at 1%, that's about a thousand, uh, I'm sorry, a million bases, and that's considered pretty close in genetic distance. Recombination, interestingly, is not uniform across the genome, and it's affected by the DNA sequence and structure. As we've learned, there's many places in the genome in which structure influences how readily uh, the, D the DNA opens up and recombines. Interestingly, recombination is different between males and females. And interference refers to the fact that if a recombination event has occurred in a particular place, recombination events around that place are, are less likely to occur. So using these, uh, this knowledge of how recombination is related to distance between markers and traits, this is how Friedman and colleagues marched forward on the genome of the mouse looking for the leptin gene. So just as we saw earlier in a pedigree of a family, you're looking for places when you do linkage mapping that appear to segregate with the trait. And when, so for example, in this pedigree, we saw that this red genotype on this chromosome was always segregating with the affected individuals in this particular pedigree. In the other videos that you watched, you didn't see this uh, perfect relationship between a particular genotype and a, a phenotype. And when that gene or marker is no longer segregating with the trait of interest, that's when you know a recombination event has probably occurred.
So what Friedman and colleagues did was they went to a place on, chrom on mouse chromosome 6 that was already known to be close to where the OB gene lied, lie. And they started to basically march along this chromosome looking at recombination events. So of 1,601 meioses, or offspring, they were looking to see how many times that particular marker was segregating with the trait, which would be the obese mouse. In the case of this marker, um, at near the Pax4 gene, of 1,601 meioses, 677 events were recombination. So they knew that they were pretty far away from the gene. They continue to march forward, and you see the recombination events going down. As they get closer to this marker D6RCK39, you get an even lower recombination fraction. And here at marker at right at that D6RCK39, only 111 meioses uh, recombination events took place out of 1,601 possible recombination events, so getting a pretty small um, recombination fraction. As they marched forward further, now the recombination fraction started to go back up. And as they moved a little bit further away, they see again that the recombination fraction is uh, rising. So using this knowledge, they know that they were close to the OB gene and that it was somewhere between those two markers. Now they can go forward looking more closely at a much smaller sequence than they were originally interrogating. And they can use other molecular techniques to interrogate this region. At this point, Friedman and colleagues knew that they were very close to the gene. And what they needed was some sequence to work with. They didn't have next generation sequencing, but they did have a clever a resource which was called clone libraries. You, back then you would take yeast and you would cut up little pieces of an organism you were interested in and put them inside these yeast uh, chromosomes. Then you could take the yeast and you could express the genes and you could study the genes um, in a much smaller system than a mouse. So these yeast libraries had already been created and sequenced and using these pieces of yeast DNA with a piece of mouse DNA inside, they were able to um, bioinformatically create some sequence that spanned this region. Wherever there was a missing sequence, they took even smaller pieces of uh, DNA libraries that are called BACs. They were bacterial chromosomes in which little pieces of mouse DNA had been placed, and they used these P1 clones to then map across that missing region. So now they have one contiguous region of DNA that they can use to interrogate. Um, so what they did was they used a very, very clever, clever analysis. So using these pieces of DNA that they knew spanned their target region, they used a clever technique called exon trapping. In exon trapping, you use a vector, which is a piece of circular DNA that can be expressed um, in, in bacteria and other kinds of cells. This particular vector has a promoter site from the SV40 virus. It has two exons that are reporter exons, shown here in red, and then it has a multiple cloning site that can be cut with an enzyme and opened up, and a piece of DNA, foreign DNA, can be inserted into that site. Then you take that uh, piece of now linear DNA and make it circular again and transfect it into cells. The ones they used here in this experiment were called cost cells, which are cells that use the SV40 to express genes. The reason why you want to put the fragment in a particular site is that what you want to create is a artificial RNA sequence that contains the two red exons. And if your DNA fragment contains an exon 2, so consensus sequence for splicing, then altogether those pieces of DNA that are ex transcription of which is driven by the SV40 promoter 
will be expressed as a piece of RNA. So you express the genes and isolate the RNA and use it as a template for making cDNA. And then you can use PCR to amplify your DNA and sequence that particular fragment. After they had extracted RNA from their cell culture, then they took that RNA and separated it out on a, on a gel. And sure enough, they see a band that is only present in the OB-OB animals and they called that band 2G7. The next experiment they did was to look at the expression of this particular um, product across many tissues within the OB-OB animals. And as they hoped, the expression only showed in white fat and no other tissues, signaling that it might be that molecule that tells the brain how much stored energy there is. Once they had a piece of RNA, as we said earlier, they can use that RNA to create cDNA and then sequence the gene. And here they used regular Sanger sequencing to sequence the gene. And sure enough, the exon that they extracted contained a start sequence. And when they compared the sequence of the wild type animals to the OBOB animals, what they found was that the OBOB animals had a premature stop codon that caused the animals to have an abundance of RNA product, but a completely non-functional protein product. So that explained the mutation. Their final experiment was to look at the DNA sequence of the OB-OB gene, or leptin as they had called it by now, to see whether or not it was conserved across species. So this is called a zoo blot, and what you can see is that this is the expression of the gene across a number of different um, organisms, mammalian and else and otherwise. Um, and you can see that leptin is clearly an important protein across many different types of organisms. The years of work and careful thought put in by Friedman and his group led to a landmark paper published in 1994 in Nature, in which the OBOB mouse made the front cover. This work also won Jeff Friedman the Lasker Award, which is the highest award given to an American scientist. This discovery led us to the understanding of the many and redundant pathways that regulate feeding behavior. Interestingly, although it took many years to clone the OB or leptin gene, the cloning of its receptor took much, went much faster. Tartaglia and colleagues decided to use expression cloning rather than positional cloning. So rather than doing lots and lots of animal breeding and documenting recombination events, they took advantage of the fact that the leptin protein was already identified and the sequence of it, both at the level of nucleotides and of amino acids, was already known. So they created uh, an artificial sequence that included both the leptin sequence and the sequence for another protein called alkaline phosphatase. And they expressed this in expression vectors. The nice thing about alkaline phosphatase is that it is also a secreted protein, so it ensured that leptin would be secreted if it was supposed to be secreted. And alkaline phosphatase participates in an enzymatic reaction that, makes, that emits light. So it's a great tag for looking to see where the protein is binding. When they did these binding assays, they revealed that the tagged leptin actually bound to the choroid plexus in the brain. And here you see sequential brain slices where they're really identifying and narrowing down the parts of the brain in which leptin is binding. They actually tested other tissues too, and they were pleased and um, reinforced their hypotheses that this particular protein should bind in the brain. Then, having identified a target tissue, they could extract total RNA from the choroid plexus, convert it to cDNA, and then expose that cDNA to a, a cell line called COS7 cells, which would then take up the cDNA and actually express it as RNA and protein. They took 
systematically uh, created pools of the RNA, divided them up and put them in these cell lines. And after allowing time for expression of the cDNA, the cells were then incubated with leptin fusion protein. So they systematically identified the pools of RNA that were positively binding to uh, the fusion protein. And then they would take a positive pool and divide it up again until they had a single pool where a clone remained with positive binding. Then they could go back and they could say, here is the protein. Let's go back and see what the sequence is. So Tartaglia and colleagues correctly predicted several things about the, the uh, OBR, as, what, as they called it, leptin receptor protein. They predicted that it had a mature extracellular domain that didn't fold, that had about 816 amino acids, and it resembled very much class 1 cytokine receptor family receptors. They also identified that it was very closely related to another receptor type called GP130 that was similar to the interleukin-6 receptor. Those parts of their paper were correct. What they weren't correct about was that later studies revealed that the leptin receptor has both long and short forms, and that they had identified the short form, while the long form is actually the bioactive form. The short form is expressed in peripheral tissues rather than the brain with unknown function. The defect in the DBDB mice is actually due to an insertion of 106 base pairs right at the alternative splice site between the short and the long forms of the protein. What happens in DBDB mice is that this insertion of sequence creates an early truncation of the long form of the protein, which then is, of course, inactive and doesn't um, give the downstream signals once the leptin protein binds. So returning to this original hypothesis about how the brain receives signals from the periphery about stored energy. This hypothesis was first expressed in the 1950s before we knew any of the molecules that might be fitting into this hypothesis. And as it turns out, the discovery of leptin is absolutely consistent with this early hypothesis. We know now that leptin is expressed in adipocytes almost exclusively. We know it's a secreted protein and it travels through the circulation, crosses the blood-brain barrier, and reaches its, its receptor in the hypothalamus. We know that neurons containing the leptin receptor then intercalate with other, recept other types of neurons that then secrete things like satiety factors and thermogenic factors. And we're going to cover more of the detail of this model as we move forward.